tuned in to the Andrew Lawton Show. But I do want to turn to what's happening in your child's classroom. This has been an issue in which I think for far too long, parents have been, I don't want to say complacent, but they've just been trusting. They've trusted the system that when your kids go to school, they're learning about the things they're supposed to be learning about. It's a reasonable assumption, but not exactly in 2024. We have heard so many stories. I would say some, in fact, rising to the threshold of horror stories about where parents have just been mortified to learn what their kids are learning or perhaps not learning is a better way of putting it. Now, parents, when they learn about this, overwhelmingly reject it. This was a bit encouraging. It came out in a study done by the Fraser Institute last week on how parents do in fact want balance and not political bias when it comes to what's being taught in the K-12 classroom. 86% agree that there needs to be facts over opinions in Canadian classrooms. The overall support for parental notice of controversial topics, another key sticking point here, 81 one percent believe in this. Some other numbers we'll dig into here with the study author Paige McPherson from the Fraser Institute. She is the Associate Director of Education Policy and it's always good to have her on. Paige, thanks for coming on today. Yeah, thanks for having me. So, I mean, in some ways, it, it seems just blatantly obvious when you put the question to a parent, do you want your kid to get facts in the classroom? Well, of course, they're going to say yes, but it's not obvious in practice as we're seeing. Yeah, so I think this is interesting and it sort of speaks to two different things. One is um, whether teachers focus on facts or whether they share um, opinions or interpretations of their own of those facts in the classroom. And the other is the curriculum, you know, which the provincial government does have uh, quite a lot of input into, control over, um, and whether or not that focuses on specific facts that children should be learning or so so in other words whether it's really content rich or if it leaves it more open um, to teachers interpretations it gives kind of a vague overview and then teachers can roll with it in whichever direction that they choose so we gave the framing um, you know that sometimes there is some debate over whether or not teachers should be sharing um, their the, the facts or their interpretations of the facts which can include their opinions and as you said 86 percent of uh of parents with kids in K-12 schools with a representative sampling right across the country, so in every province and region, 86% of those parents believe that teachers and curriculum in K-12 schools should focus on providing students with facts rather than teachers' interpretations or opinions and a learning environment within which students can openly explore those facts. Were these pretty constant across the country? They were, yeah. So we really found um, just with one, we can get into it later, it has to do with whether or not uh, a child um, should be, or parents should be able to remove a child from a specific a controversial lesson without impacting the child's grade. Uh, parents in Quebec did not, the majority did not feel that way. In literally every case, on every question that we asked, um, in every province or region, parents were in complete consensus, uh, not complete consensus, but overwhelming majority consensus that um, that they should be involved um, and informed about what their children are learning, and that facts uh, are really are are really important and and should trump opinions in classrooms and in informal school activities. When we had last fall the discussion of, of quote unquote parental rights, it was typically from one side of the equation and it was about one particular area predominantly. It was about a, a lot of gender and, and teachings related to sexuality. But the questions that you're asking are on their face content neutral here. When you're saying facts, not opinions, uh, that could be someone who is like a really, really hardcore climate change alarmist that doesn't want uh, an opinion critical of that, or it could be the opposite of that. So uh, the whole point of this as I would see it is that when you put facts above a teacher's opinion facts above a teacher's interpretation it is non-discriminating yeah that's right so you know I think what is a controversial issue and as you said you know 81 percent more than four and five parents with kids in K-12 schools believe that schools should provide advance notice of controversial topics being discussed in class 
or during formal school activities, what is a controversial issue is going to depend on the family. The different mm -hmm. families are going to have different views on what a controversial is for their kids. And what we see here is that there is a clear consensus among uh, parents that they, they want to be given a heads up so they can make their own decisions for their kids. And we explained, you know, in sort of our preambles to these questions, we did this polling with Leger, you know, very reputable polling firm here in Canada, um, that, you know, the controversial issues, just some examples might involve sexuality or gender, might involve um, how we respond to climate change. Uh, but but ultimately, you're right. I mean, it could be any sort of issue. Um, and it really depends on the family. Some families might wish to discuss these issues with their children in advance. Other families might wish to remove their child from a lesson that they just don't feel is age appropriate. But ultimately, parents want to have that heads up. So explain to me where policymakers should go with this, because we saw a little flurry of this in New Brunswick, in Saskatchewan, in Alberta. We certainly haven't seen it nationally. I think in Ontario, there's been a bit of ambiguity about uh, where the province wants to go with this. But what would you take from this if you were to write the policy that government should be looking at? Well, I think, you know, when it comes to curriculum, this is a really important takeaway from these poll results, in my view, um, because parents so strongly feel 86% feel that facts should be emphasized rather than teachers' opinions. Um, that really speaks to how curriculum should be de designed, and it should be including more facts, and it should be content rich, which gives teachers a very clear framework and guide to how they should be teaching these subjects. For example, we looked at most uh, recently in a study that we released at the Fraser Institute at the history curricula in Manitoba, BC, and Ontario. In BC and Ontario, there were very few specific facts that children had to learn by the time they graduated grade 12. By the time they graduated high school, they had to know almost no Canadian history. So if you were to change the curriculum, change those curriculum guides for teachers, make it a lot more specific about what exact facts, the people, the dates, you know, the names, all of these different things um, that children uh, should be learning in their curriculum, well, then it gives teachers a much more clear framework of what to teach rather than just teach about genocide. And then they can kind of go in whichever direction that they like. Ultimately, that means that who the child's teacher is uh, really matters uh, because they can take it in so many different directions. So I think it speaks to curriculum. It also uh, speaks to, I think, you know, just the expectations around how teachers have to present the material. So more than three quarters of parents, 76% believe that children should be presented both sides of controversial issues or they should be avoided entirely. If you can't present both sides, do not talk about controversial issues with our kids. 91% of parents believe classroom material and discussions should always be age appropriate. And as we talked about that 81% uh, of parents uh, with kids in K to 12 schools believe that schools should provide advanced notice. So as you said, you know, this has come up in Ontario, New Brunswick, where there's third party groups that are presenting to kids. Um, in New Brunswick recently, there was a discussion that was supposed to be about HPV went in a, a totally different direction, addressing a bunch of different sexual behaviors. Parents were outraged. The premier spoke out. Um, and, and so this is something that really could have been avoided if parents had just been given that advance notice. So if pr provincial governments, you know, say to, to school boards, you need to give that advance notice, it has to be kind of baked in there, um, then individual schools or school boards will know that that's an expectation. Now, th this is getting into a trickier territory, and I'll give you the upfront warning that you can just sidestep the question if you'd like, because you're a, a policy analyst here and not a, a politician. But there's a challenge now in that the word fact has been weaponized in, in a lot of ways. And there are, there are subjects that uh, people that are putting what's clearly an opinion would uh, just defend tooth and nail as fact. And I think you see this on uh, some gender things where uh, you have a, a certain group that s says something is settled and it's not. So if we dig into this a little bit further, how do you account for that in this when you'll have a curricula which are developed uh, totally thinking or totally uh, asserting things as facts that might not be? Well, so we actually specifically got to that a little bit in our questions and how we frame them. We specifically said but controversial issues about which there is no clear societal consensus or consensus among experts. So there are some things where there is a societal consensus, right? And I mean, you could go down the rabbit hole, but we know that there are, are you know, two plus two equals four. And obviously, I know you can run with this, Andrew, <laughs> but <laughs> in general, we know that there are things that are established facts that children should be taught. Then there are things like the response to climate change, like sexuality and gender, where there might not be a societal consensus or a 
a clear consensus among experts. And that is specifically what we ask parents about in this poll. In those instances, do you want advance notice? Parents said yes. Do you want to be um, able to remove your child from the classroom? Um, and, and nationally speaking, I said, I, as I mentioned, the only real outlier on this was, was parents in Quebec. Um, but seven in 10 parents believe that other parents should have the right to remove their child from a lesson without consequence to their child's grade um, if it is regarding a controversial issue. So parents um, are, again, there's a very clear majority here that believe that if there is no societal consensus on these controversial issues, give parents the ability to decide. Of course, what you're asking about gets to curriculum design as well. Um, and, and ultimately, I think, you know, what we're hearing from this poll, if I had to interpret that parents are, are strongly valuing facts rather than interpretations or opinions in terms of what their children are going to be exposed to in lessons and in formal school activities, that to me sends the message that we should just focus on those clearly established facts and not wade into the political stuff in our formal curriculum and curriculum guides. There you go. You took the tough question head on. So I appreciate that, Paige. And just before I let you go, I have to ask you about uh, what's happened in Alberta here this week. We talked about this in the Ontario context, and you had said basically it was a good start, that they uh, were doing some things that you liked and you wish they would do more. This is referring to getting cell phones out of the classroom. Uh, Alberta has come out now and said that cell phones from kindergarten to grade 12 will be out of the classroom with narrow exceptions for students that have you know particular health needs. Uh, is this basically what you wanted in Ontario in Alberta now? I think that um, the devil will be in the details as the provincial government moves forward um, with this policy. The policy seems to suggest that phones need to be out of sight and on silent um, or turned off. So how they enforce, okay, will it be turned off? The issue that sometimes comes up with these policies, and this happened in Ontario, who you years ago introduced a policy around this and it just wasn't tough enough because it left it up to the individual um, schools or boards to decide. Um, and, and ultimately you had teachers who were having to surveil and nag their students all day. You had phones that were on silent and out of sight, but they were buzzing in kids' pockets. And we know that this creates a distraction not only for Johnny, but for Susie, who's then distracted by Johnny, who's reaching for his pocket. And it can take kids, according to some studies, a full 20 minutes to regain focus on an academic lesson after being distracted by a digital device. Um, so I think the best kind of policy is something that is as blanket as possible, uh, right across the board, with phones locked away for the school day. So whether you've got them in those, those you know, yonder pouches, the, the lockable pouches, in kids' lockers, in some sort of special designated phone locker. I think that's the cleanest, simplest policy with some exceptions, uh, which actually, you know, we had noted in our writing about this at the Fraser Institute in the Alberta government, I think the education minister specifically noted one reasonable exem uh, exemption would be for a diabetic student who needs to monitor his blood sugar using an app on his phone. There are reasonable exemptions in there, but giving, you know, every kid who asks for one, oh, I just need to check my phone for such and such a reason, it's very distracting for that kid and the other kids in the class. And ultimately, the research shows it really does have a negative impact on academic outcomes, particularly math scores. Um, so I think Alberta, you know, like I said, it, the details will matter here. I think they have an opportunity to really be a leader on this issue by having a very clear and blanket ban, but we'll see where they go with it. Well, and the, the problem of the, inf the enforcement problem is one, but it also if teachers are the ones that really have to enforce this, creates the patchwork, just as with every other rule in school. Some teachers are more lenient than others. Some will turn a blind eye. I had some teachers where you could wear the hat in the classroom, others you could chew gum. So you're going to see that same dynamic here. And, and all of a sudden, as you mentioned, you're not even seeing this blanket ban in action. Yeah, well, exactly. And I mean, Look, I'm, you know, I don't think that at the Fraser Institute, we are uh, quick to say, oh, we need government to ban all of these different <laughs> things. Um, but but ultimately, the research on this really is just so clear um, in terms of student academic outcomes, but also mental health. There's cyberbullying that goes on through the day at schools. It's extremely distracting for kids. It impacts their ability to socialize face to face. It impacts their ability um, to to not be distracted, to actually focus in class and academic achievement, student success like this is what schools are for so we do ban things in schools and of course this is government policy 
for government schools. There are already independent schools and charter schools in Alberta that are leading on this issue. They've already implemented their own uh, policies to ban phones in the classroom, um, and they're doing so quite successfully. That doesn't mean that there needs to be sort of a ban on technology unless a school wants to go in that direction because that's sort of the approach that they're offering. Um, but you can still be innovative and, and leave room for kids learning about technology without that really deep digital distraction. And as you say, that patchwork approach where teachers are having having to take so much time out of their day to nag and surveil. And then some teachers are not doing it because they've thrown up their hands and they've said, I can't enforce this if I'm not backed up by a clear government policy that I can say, look, it's out of my hands. It's not my decision. We don't bring drugs to school. We don't bring weapons to school. We don't bring our smartphones into the classroom. And that's just how it is. Um, so I do think that in this case, you know, there are certain things we ban at school and smartphones should be one of them. All right. Well, great stuff as always. Paige McPherson, thank you so much for coming on today. Thank you. Thanks for listening to The Andrew Lawton Show. Support the program by donating to True North at www.tnc.news.